Seven o'clock. I'm going to call a special meeting of the Board of Aldermen to order on Monday, April 25th, 2022 at 7 p.m. in the Aldermanic Chamber, as well as via Zoom teleconference. Prayer will be offered by Deputy City Clerk Allison Waite, and Alderman Dowd will lead us in the Pledge to the Flag. Almighty God, we have the high honor and the serious duty to manage the affairs of our beloved city. Fill us, O God, with a spirit of unity and understanding, which enables us to face our multiple problems with a serene mind, with justice and charity for all, so that any and all decisions made by us will always be for the betterment and greater happiness of all our fellow citizens. So help us, God. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, Mr. Clerk, do we have any members on Zoom? Uh, not that I see, Madam President. No? Okay. To join by Zoom, please refer to the agenda or the website for the meeting link and telephone number. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please indicate a participating via Zoom while you're not in, at the meeting in person and whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Uh, Deputy Clerk, would you please call the roll? Alderman O'Brien. Present. Alderman Sullivan. Here. Alderman Clee. Here. Alderman Moran. Alderman Lopez. Alderman Jetty. Here. Alderman Clemens, Alderwoman Kelly, Alderman Kamau. Present. Alderman Dowd. Present. Alderman Gobia. Here. Alderman Kathy. Present. Alderman Tebow. Here. Alderwoman Timmons. And Alderman Wilshire. Here. You have 10 in attendance and zero via Zoom. Thank you very much. Um, as is customary, I'm going to turn the meeting over to the chairman of the Budget Review Committee, Alderman Dowd. Yes. Tonight we're going to have a public hearing on two items, on R22020, authorizing the mayor and the city treasurer to issue bonds not to exceed the amount of $37,500,000 to fund the second five-year phase of a 10-year pavement management plan. And the second will be R22021, changing the purpose of up to $152,030 of unexpected bond proceeds, unexpended bond proceeds from the fire department pumper truck and aerial ladder truck purchases to infrastructure improvements to the municipal fire alarm system. The first item that we will take out is R22020. I believe the mayor would like to speak first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we have Mr. Hudson here who is going to follow up with uh, many of the details. But what happened is that f for those who weren't here five years ago, uh, in evaluating the condition of the city streets, uh, street by street, according to a paving condition index, uh, we found that the condition of our streets was not good. And that had resulted from many years of underinvestment in infrastructure, particularly in the paving of city streets. And at that point, we were on, we'd been paving a few miles a year, five, six miles a year, and we were on maybe a, there are 300 miles of streets, so we maybe were on a 50 to 60 year replacement schedule. So we, based upon the evaluation that was done, uh, we came forward with a paving plan of action, a 10 year plan. And we proposed that over 10 years, we would uh, spend $7,500,000 per year for 10 years. And if we did that, the condition of Nashua streets would be dramatically improved. So, but we decided to seek authority for five years of the plan so that we could evaluate uh, the situation at the end of five years. We're about five years in now. We've paved nearly 125 miles of streets. And through a different, through a, another 
preservation procedure called crack sealing. We've crack sealed over 100 miles of streets. Uh, crack sealing preserves the street for a period of about five years. Uh, now it is time to undertake the second phase of the 10-year paving plan of action. Uh, in, and in, in doing so, we are seeking your authority to bond for the second 37500000 That's $7.5 million a year for five more years. And if you authorize that, we can again uh, pave another over another 100 miles of streets, and we can again dramatically improve the condition of our basic infrastructure. I think this is a plan that I believe this is a program that the citizens of Nashua have broadly endorsed. Certainly, there are still streets in bad shape. But in terms of evaluating which streets should be paved, Public Works uses the paving condition index that has was originally developed and which is updated year by year so that the condition of each street uh, is monitored uh, and reevaluated on a, on a two-year cycle. Uh, that gives you the overview, but Mr. Hudson, and I want to thank him and the engineering staff for uh, all of the work they've done over these years in supervising the work. Uh, we did adopt a new procedure about one year in. Uh, in addition to, and I mentioned this the other night, in addition to checking the condition of the paving as it is applied at, on the site, based upon the recommendation of a very experienced uh, paving contractor, uh, we began to evaluate the quality of the asphalt at the plant. So we knew at production and at application that the quality was net specs. Uh, this is very important because if slight alteration in the recipe of the paving, a little more sand or uh, other elements, uh, can cause a deterioration in the quality of the paving that eventually is applied. Uh, but that procedure will continue. And with that, I give you uh, Mr. Hudson, city engineer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, Chair and members of the board. Uh, pleased to be here tonight to speak about the paving program. I'm going to try to share a brief presentation um, via the Zoom. So let's see how this works. Okay, great. Um, so again, we're here to speak about the multi-year paving program as the mayor outlined. There we go. Um, so this evening we'll talk briefly about the history. Uh, we'll talk about the methodology of the program, different treatments, um, budgetary needs, and then uh, wrap up with a conclusion. Paving history, as uh, the mayor spoke to prior to 2017, um, city paved six to eight miles annually. Uh, and then we embarked on this 10-year uh, paving program, $75 million in total, for the first half funded under R17. Uh, 0.92. First uh, five years, we resurfaced over 100 miles, uh, and that average PCI has increased uh, pretty dramatically, bumped up about 10 points. Again, this is a 0 to 100 scale, so, um, uh, you know, from a uh, uh, just better than failing grade, so let's say, to, uh, you know, a C average or so. so. Um, and then as currently proposed, our 22.020, which is to address the second half of the program. The map on the right shows the streets that have been paved uh, during the initial years of the program. Um, with that, I'm going to turn over to Senior Staff Engineer Mark Saunders, who will cover some of the details of the program. Mr. Saunders? Senior Staff Engineer Mark Saunders. <clears throat> Th thank you, Dan. So Nashua has about um, around 300 miles of publicly accepted roadways. These 300 miles are broken into, uh, into segments that are graded on a, on a PCI score of 0 to 100. There's about 1,500 segments that we, uh, we survey every, uh, we survey a third of the city every year. So every three years, we're getting a, uh, a whole picture of, of the network as a whole. Each one of these uh, PCI scores fall within a treatment band. Understanding this condition of the roadway segments allows models to, to be developed to determine budget recommendations that reflect those conditions. 
Uh, the treatment ban examples here, um, there's, there's five. They range from do nothing to base rehab. As the treatment bans get more extensive, they also get more expensive. Right here, so uh, the top left is Dan Danforth Road over, over off DW Highway. That was paved in 2020, so that is in a do-nothing condition. Where in the bottom right is French Street off of off of um, Manchester, which is in a, needs to be a base re rehabilitated. Street selection. The street selection process is very dynamic and requires coordination between multiple parties. The first step in the street selection process is to analyze that PCI data to develop a preliminary street list. The PCI data is the first tool used in the selection process. Once a preliminary street is developed, it needs to be cleared and reviewed for utility conflicts. Under the pavement is a vast network. No, Dan, sorry, I'm go back. Under the pavement is a vast network of utilities that consists of gas, water, sewer, and storm facilities that need to be cleared through coordination screening efforts between um, the, the DPW and the other service providers, uh, Liberty and Penichuk. We do work with Liberty, Liberty and Penichuk to align their capital projects with our paving schedule so that paving is the last operation on the road. And these projected paving lists are sent to these utility companies for screening before final street selection. In conjunction with clearing the roads, any utility conflicts are field reviewed and confirmed that the, that the proposed treatment matches what has been prescribed. The constructability aspect is also used to determine other roads and neighborhoods that are a similar condition that will limit the impact and disruption to neighborhoods. This also builds an attractive contract for our competitive bids. Along with the paving of the roads, we, uh, we do preventive maintenance. As the road network, network improves, pr preservation and maintenance activity should be increased to keep the good roads good. Several preservation techniques are currently being used in the city. The goal is to pilot several other treatments to determine which one works best for the community and the network. Uh, the first one we, we use pretty regularly is a crack sealing. This is the application of an asphalt rubber compound seal to prevent moisture from entering the cracks leading to further degradation. The next treatment we are starting to use is a fog seal. This is a full width topical rejuvenator that penetrates the pavement to soften the asphalt binder and bind its aggregates to slow oxidation, limit raveling, and seal minor cracks. This technology was recently piloted last year and we are looking to do around five miles this, this upcoming year. The next treatment shown is uh, microsurfacing. This is a proven treatment used by other neighboring communities. Microsurfacing is a mixture of poly-modified poly asphalt emulsion and aggregates installed in two thin lifts on a properly prepared surface. This provides skid resistance, restricts moisture intrusion, protects the underlying structure from oxidation and raveling and restores the roadway uh, appearance. We are looking to do a, about a mile of microsurfacing this year as a pilot program. And the last one is a bonded wearing course. This is the closest to a hot mix overlay. Uh, this is a spray pair appl application of poly modified asphalt emulsion combined with an ultra thin gap graded hot mix asphalt overlay. This seals the underlying pavement, small cracks, minor rut in, and surface imperfections and restores the roadway appearance. So part of this process, we look to do a complete street. So once, once we leave the road after paving, the road, is, um, the road is complete. So in addition to resurfacing the roadway, we're looking to addre address, um, when possible, sidewalk access, roadway drainage, traffic detection, sign replacement, pavement markings, and casting replacement. An effort is being made to reconstruct access ramps to existing sidewalks within the project limits to be compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Existing drainage issues are evaluated before and during construction to correct where feasible. The extent of the drainage correction is directly related to the specified treatment for the road. Major inter intersections are evaluated for traffic detection systems. Other locations have underground retection replaced. An effort is being made to replace damaged or faded regulatory signs. Once the road is, is final paved, both thermoplastic and retroreflective pavement markings are used to reestablish, are used to reestablish re the pavement markings. And lastly, non-standard sewer, drain, and catch basin castings are being replaced. At this time, I'll turn the presentation over to City Engineer Dan Hudson. 
Thank you, Mark. So uh, I just want to summarize again the work completed to date. The city's uh, resurfaced over 100 miles, first five years of the program on 520 streets. Uh, crack sealed over 100 miles on 400 streets, and we've increased the average PCI or pavement condition index 11 points. Um, this graph uh, shows you that change in that amount of time. Clearly, there's been a significant change. Um, the 2022 paving program this year, we plan to resurface about 14 miles of roadway on 65 roads. Um, and then we have about three miles that we didn't complete last year because of utility issues or weather or whatnot. So we'll complete that work. Um, and then crack sealing, fog sealing, and microsurfacing as shown. If we go forward and do and fund the second uh, five-year uh, bond uh, for the 10-year program, this is how we project conditions will change. PCIs will continue to improve. Um, backlog, which is basically you know the uh, blank check sort of scenario. You know, how, how, if you uh, we're going to uh, write a check to solve everything, that's how much it would be at that point in time. Of course, it's important to note that roadways continually degrade. It's not a static thing. So although you pave a road, it does uh, have a deterioration cycle. Um, so so it's, uh, it's a continually uh, evolving thing. Um, so our recommendation uh, is to fund the second uh, five years of the 10-year program, expand uh, routine and, and preventive maintenance. Uh, we are improving roads, and now we want to keep the good roads good versus letting them slide uh, back into a deteriorated state. Uh, and continue this approach that we've been on of pavement management where it's a continual cycle of reviewing condition, determining what the appropriate treatment is, making that treatment before it slides into a more expensive category, um, and so on uh, over and over again. And that in the long term saves the city money by, uh, by doing this process. Uh, it's a fiscally responsible way to um, address the roadway. So. That's the end of uh, the presentation we have prepared, and we'd be happy to address any questions. Do any of the aldermen have a question for either the mayor or Mr. Hudson? Yes, Alderman Kathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is for Mr. Hudson. I understand that road conditions do change over time, but if you could, what is the average lifespan of this particular uh, project? So if we get done in the next five years, will be pretty much completed this program. It'll be X amount of years before we would have to get to this point again. Yeah, I don't have a specific years for you. Obviously, we've played catch up and made a vast improvement. The, the years depends on what the treatment was. So in some cases, we've, a lot of roads we've only crack sealed. So uh, we've pro, you know, prolonged the uh, service life of that roadway, deferring the cost of paving uh, where we have been paving, we've been milling and paving um, on a residential roadway that could last, you know, 15, 20 years. On our arterial roadway, it might last uh, 10, 12, uh, because the, that sees much heavier vehicle loading and, and uh, subjected to trucking and all those sorts of things. Um, so it really depends. Um, we haven't projected, you know, do what, what the scenario would be doing nothing. I mean, we would hope and expect that the city would continue to do paving work. Um, um, to keep, as I said, to keep the good roads good. You've made this large investment and you really want to uh, maintain that by, by doing the preservation treatment. But um, through this program, we won't, pro we won't likely get to every road. So there'll still, be, there'll still be roads to pave and we'll be at the end of a 10 year program and some of those roads that we did early in the program are gonna start sh showing some aging, especially the uh, arterials um, in those heavily, more heavily used roadways. Thank you. All set. And then for somebody that was in logistics for 40 years, I can tell you that if you stay ahead of the game, you spend a lot less than what we unfortunately did and let the roads go for a number of years. And then it costs you a lot of money to catch up. So the idea is to formulate a plan once the majority of roads are done and stay ahead of it by doing a few roads every year so that you don't get in a position where you have hundreds of miles that you have to pay. Any other, yes, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Alderman Chairman. Sullivan. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, with the infrastructure bill that was passed by the federal government, uh, I believe it was 2022, and then with the ADA compliance that we have to uh, adhere to, 
Are there any federal funds that could come to the city to help offset the cost? That's sure, that's a good question. Um, we'll have to evaluate the recent federal funding to see if the, there is funding there to support. We, we do a lot of work in conjunction with this program. We have a lot of safe routes to school projects we've done to improve ADA and sidewalks. Uh, one of the things that this paving program doesn't do much of is fund sidewalk work. It, it, it addresses the uh, connection to the sidewalk systems, uh, which is the ADA part. Um, but yeah, we, we, we do uh, look to leverage and combine projects and potentially maybe there is some funding that can help offset this. That's something we'll have to look more into. Um, uh, case, you know, good case in point was Charlotte Ave project where there was a safe routes project. We built some new sidewalk. We, um, consolidated pedestrian crossings and uh, made made all that system safe and then alongside of that we timed our paving program for that street to come in and pave the road and restripe it um, to, to promote traffic calming so um, there's, there's uh, many projects throughout the city and um, and various funding avenues and we do look at all of those Thanks. All set. yes Alderman Glee uh, thank you um, mr. chairman um, Mr. Hudson, uh, you, you brought up the Charlotte Street. We have the, the Lock Street, Lock and Whitney Street, which is also the Safe Routes to School project that we're still waiting to get that money and hopefully a little bit more <laughs> considering things have gone up since then. Um, that particular project, and I'm sure the Charlotte Street was the same thing, that did not allow you to do the streets. Is that correct? So a lot, oftentimes they'll give us this funding, but it's only for the sidewalks. It's only for ADA compliance, and I think bike bike paths are part of it, but they don't allow it to be used for specifically for the roads and paving. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So the, 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 that's a local project administered uh, project, basically funding passed uh, from federal highway through DOT managed by the city, but the various funding uh, programs allow only allow certain things. So it's hard to do a complete street project and do the whole thing. And, um, you know, the state in these programs, they have a limited pot of money, and so they divvy it up amongst communities. So you can only do projects uh, of a certain size. It's typically not enough to do a full project. So yes, um, the Lock and Whitney area, we'll do this. We'll do a similar thing. I mean, we, we first, we'll, well, right now we're starting to look at the utilities because we know we have sewer issues up in that uh, neighborhood, um, and we'll talk with the other utility agencies about work they might need to do. We'll build the sidewalks and then likely, very likely, we'll time paving to follow uh, some of that work um, as we did in uh, Charlotte Ave Project. Yeah. Yes, Alderman Clean. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I think both Locke and Whitney um, two years ago actually ended up on your paving list and we had to take them off because we were waiting for this funding and we didn't want to have to um, dig up the streets as, as a result of having to widen the sidewalks and so on. So. I appreciate how frustrating this must be for you to have to time everything perfectly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Do you have a question, good. Alderman? Lynch? I will tell you that uh, uh, I put in for the Charlotte Ave project with uh, Mayor Lozo, and it took us five years to get the money. And then when they yeah. do the project, you have federal and state oversight, as Mr. Hudson can attest to, people looking over your shoulder to make sure you spend the money right. But it takes a long time to get those funds in. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'll open up the public hearing. Any testimony in favor of R20, excuse me, R22020? Seeing none. Nobody online. Any testimony in opposition? Once again, testimony in favor? Seeing none. And once again, testimony in opposition? And again, seeing none. Mm -hmm. I will now close the public hearing on Resolution R22020 at 724 p.m. And we will open the Resolute the public hearing on R22021, changing the purpose of up to $152,030 of unexpended bond proceeds from the fire department pumper truck and aerial ladder truck purchases 
do infrastructure improvements to the municipal fire alarm system. Uh, Chief, would you like to come up and give us an overview? By the way, I will mention, I think we mentioned this before in bonding, you know, you can either not spend the bonding money or to save a lot of time, money, and effort, you can repurpose the funds that you didn't spend. It's, it's much more um, fluid to do that than rebond for something. Alderman, uh, yes. Chief? Good evening. Steve Buxton, National Fire Rescue. Um, so what we're looking to do here is, as uh, Alderman Dowd said, is repurpose some uh, money that we had left on the table from two of our apparatus purposes, uh, purchases. Uh, National Fire Rescue Fire Alarm Division maintains a municipal loop system. Uh, most people know these as the uh, fire alarm pull boxes they see on telephone poles or on commercial buildings within the city. Uh, these boxes actually provide a direct connection for roughly $1.6 billion worth of property in the city of Nashua. Um, two of these circuits, as we refer to them, um, are somewhat overloaded and have not kept pace with the expansion. Our system is very well man maintained. However, the city is growing to a point that some of our circuits are overloaded. Two that need particular attention are the Amherst Street Corridor, what's known as Circuit 15 at this point in time, uh, utilizing the Veterans Memorial Parkway. Uh, we can uh, run cable out there. Uh, and create an additional circuit out there, which we uh, call Circuit 16. Um, just to give you an idea, um, best industry practices recommend 40 to 50 game wall boxes on a circuit. Currently, the Amherst Street corridor has about 105 boxes on it, uh, and it's very well maintained. Um, however, obviously, we need to support that. Another, another troublesome point there is that we don't have redundancy in our system in that area of town. Uh, we have a trunk line that runs up Main Street, goes across the Main Street Bridge, and then at the top of the hill, it goes uh, out Amherst Street or up Concord Street. Uh, by utilize, utilizing the Veterans Memorial Parkway, it would give us another loop across the river to the north end of town. So if we were to suffer a catastrophic failure on Main Street, for instance, Right now, as we currently stand, that section of town would be cut off uh, from the direct notification. By creating this loop in our system, it will give us redundancy, so we'll still receive alarms from that area. The other section that we're looking to uh, utilize some of this funding for is in the southwest quad quadrant, Circuit 12. Um, as you know, that area of town is being developed. Uh, we're placing a middle school out there. Uh, we currently have 61 boxes on the circuit that is out in that area, so we're looking to uh, start the process of uh, reinforcing that circuit and allowing for some expansion. So this money would give us the ability to push up and reinforce the Amherst Street corridor, as well as get another line underneath the highway uh, to reinforce the southwest quadrant. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. So we're requesting the repurposing of $152,030. Um, we have RFP'd this, um, so we have a very good understanding of what money we're looking at to get the heavy lifting out of the way at this point in time. So, and I can answer any questions anybody any may have. Any questions for the Alderman and Chief Buxton? Thank you, Chief. With that, I will open up the public hearing on R22021. Testimony in favor. No one online. None. Testimony in opposition. No one online. Once again, testimony in favor. Again, no one online. And once again, testimony in opposition. And again, no one online. With that, I will close the public hearing on Resolution R22021 at 729 p.m. Alderman O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'd like to make a motion that the April 25th, 2022 special meeting of the Board of Aldermen be adjourned. Okay, you've heard the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We're adjourned at 729. And five minutes and we'll start the budget meeting.
Okay. I'd like to call the meeting of the Budget Review Committee to order. It's Monday, May 25th, 2022 at 7.31 p.m. in the automatic chamber and via Zoom, which the meeting link can be found on the agenda. Uh, can we start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance? If you're participating via Zoom, please state your presence, reason for not attending and meeting in the room in person, whether there is anyone in the room with you during the meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Alderman O'Brien, would you call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Alderman Lodge, Larry Wilshire. Here. Alderman John Sullivan. Here. Alderman Lodge, Shoshana Kelly. Alderman Ernest Jetty. Here. Alderman John Cathy. Present. Alderman Lodge Michael O'Brien is present. Alderman Richard A. Dowd. Present. Uh, Alderman Kelly is on vacation with her family. We can't attend this evening. Also in attendance, we have uh, Kevin Rock, Police Chief, City of Nashua. Steve Buxton, Fire Chief of Nashua Fire Rescue. Dan Hudson, City Engineer and CFO John Griffin, and Matt Sullivan of uh, Community Development. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. I'm also here. Oh, and Alderman Clay, excuse me. Me too, <laughs> me too. Also, Derek. Oh, 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 oh Derek, yes. Alderman to you. Excuse me, please. First item on the agenda is public comment. Is there anyone who'd like to speak in public comment? Mr. Chairman, this is Jay Leonard speaking. I'm not sure of the uh, the the appropriate how to raise my hand or something here. <laughs> <laughs> You're always welcome to, to comment, Attorney Leonard. It is now an appropriate time. I have a comment for. Um, R22026. If it's on the agenda, yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is Thomas J. Leonard. I am a lawyer in Nashua, and I'm working with the Nashua Housing Redevelopment Authority and Boston Capital in the development of the Bronstein, uh, uh, redevelopment of the Bronstein complex. And later on, you have R22026 which is a uh, resolution to modify uh, the development agreement. And it's a pretty straightforward thing, but I, I it, with the uh, chair's uh, indulgence, I'll just make a couple of quick comments and certainly we can answer questions uh, should they come up. Um, also present here, by the way, is uh, Rich Mazzacci, who is kind of in charge of the, the overall project. He's the one who knows the most about the project, but he asked me to uh, make a couple of comments. Yes, you can, you can As, make your comments now, and then when we address R22026, if there are questions, uh, we'll have you uh, respond. Very good. So uh, basically, this the project uh, relates to, the, as I said, the redevelopment of the Bronstein Complex. Uh, Nashua Housing Development Authority and Boston Capital are working together in the redevelopment. They're both they're co-developers, uh, though Nashua Housing redevelopment authority is going to eventually be the owner and and will uh, throughout the project is the um, the operator if you will there the units are going to be managed by uh, Nashua housing redevelopment authority and it is their their real estate uh, in through the process we've been working with the city um, and and uh, uh, Matt Sullivan can certainly comment also but it's uh, it, it's been a, a joint effort uh, on the part of the city and the redevelopment, the uh, housing authority. Um, through the process, we uh, estimated some of the expenses and the short story is there's a development agreement that kind of itemizes expenses that the city and the uh, uh, authority have been working on. And one of those expenses, uh, it was agreed that the city would waive building permit fees and originally, and that's contained in the development agreement that was signed as part of this project. Um, originally, the estimation was that those fees would be approximately $100,000. But of course, as we went through the, pro the process and the project, uh, the fees became more than we expected. We being, I think, fair to say, both the city and 
the developer. Short story is uh, there was uh, uh, an agreement that there would be no fees. We estimated them at 100,000 and they turned out to be 250,000. So all this agreement does is modify the numbers in the development agreement so that the original intent, that is no, uh, no building permit fees and a, and a full wa waiver, uh, turns out to be true now that we know all the fees. Uh, the only other factor I'd like to point out is there are two agreements because there are two um, uh, limited partnerships that are supporting this project. Uh, one is referred to as Bronstein 4% and one is referred to as Bronstein 9%. And because they're actually separate entities, we had to have uh, two, um, two development agreements and two components uh, here. Other than those, that one change, that is the, uh, the specifics on the building permit fees, all of the balance of the agreement remains in full full effect. Uh, this has been reviewed by- 30 seconds. Uh, this has been reviewed by Corporation Council and uh, shouldn't be too many other questions uh, on, on the details. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Attorney Leonard. Anyone else public comment? Seeing no one, communications? Uh, from Kevin Burgess, Chairman of the Board of Fire Commission, and Reason Resolution R-22-021. There being no objection, I'll accept the communication and place it on file. <clears throat> Unfinished business? There is none. New business resolutions. Before us this evening is R-22-020. Authorizing the mayor and the city treasurer to issue bonds not to exceed the amount of $37,500,000 to fund the second five-year phase of a 10-year pavement pro, uh, management project. Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion to recommend final passage. Motion on the floor is to recommend the final passage. Are there any questions? Yes, Alderman Kathy. Uh, not a question per se. Um, can I be added as an endorser onto this legislation? Or is that too late? Yes. Okay, thank you. And then um, I would just like to comment that I obviously think it should pass. Uh, I think the city's done a great job paving, and this is obviously the second half of something that we've already sort of promised to the city to, to accomplish <coughs> the goal. So it seems like a no-brainer to me. Yeah, I would say over the last 11 years, my biggest phone call is about streets and their pavement condition. I can, I can echo that sentiment as well. I'm sure Alderman Glee can attest to in, in Ward 3. Especially in her ward with the tiny yeah. streets. <laughs> Any other comments? Alderman Jetty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I, I too am, am in favor of, uh, of this. I think it's, a, uh, it's, it's money well spent by the city and it's an important uh, project that we maintain uh, the roads as best we can. It's a, it's a big uh, part of our infrastructure, if not the biggest. And, uh, and, it's, and it certainly makes sense that we are uh, you know, continuing this, this project to repave the streets. But uh, I thought uh, since the uh, city engineer is here, um, I, I thought if I could, uh, I would like to ask him about, uh, you know, during the, uh, the, the last few years of this paving project, uh, you know, generally speaking, people have been very happy uh, with with the uh, the paving project. Uh, you know, but there there have been uh, complaints about uh, uh, you know the the, uh, uh, the level of the street in relation to the curbing. And uh, so, if if we are uh, you know the streets where there's just pavement being put on top of the the, the existing pavement, it raises the level of the street, uh, you know, to uh, you know closer to the top of the curb, which um, you know has has led in some instances of uh, you know problems with uh, you know the drainage that the curb you know the curbs kind of guide the water along, keep keeps the water in the street. Um, so I, I'm wondering, you know, do we have, 
is it part of the program to uh, you know to to raise curbs where uh, where necessary uh, or not? Is that or is it just a you know a, a, a hazard of the uh, of the project? Mr. Hudson, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Alderman Jetty. Um, we primarily what we've been doing is milling and paving, so we basically take out a depth of pavement and then we put that back. So largely we haven't been changing the grade of the edge of the roadway. Um, we try to address drainage problems where we can, but these mill and pave projects are tough just for the reasons you note. There's not a large opportunity to make a large adjustment. Uh, there is another methodology that we're using on the, the roads that are in really bad shape. That's a reclaim where we grind up the roadway. And that gives us a lot more flexibility by regrading. Um, and so we do that when we can. Um, where we have had some complaints is when we set curbing or, or uh, especially bituminous curbing where there wasn't any before. Last year we had a couple instances where, uh, you know, half the neighborhood wanted curbing and the other half didn't. And so we try to do a holistic uh, treatment and, um, and not everybody's happy with it sometimes. Um, what we do do is we go out before projects, we try to document all the issues that we see, we review complaints we've received in the past, and we do the best we can to address them, but um, can't always uh, address them to everyone's satisfaction. So um, I'm not aware of the, uh, of the loss of reveal, I know of curbing issue. I mean, if you had specifics, I'd be happy to have engineer uh, Saunders try to address that, but um, typically that's not the case because we do try to preserve that. Even if we add some additional mix to the roadway, a lot of times we'll mill the edge so that we tail out in the same place so that we don't have those drainage issues along the curb. Okay. Could I follow up? Follow up. Uh, so if you could uh, make note of uh, one, one of the streets on your list is Shore Drive. And uh, uh, it's, it was pointed out to me by uh, uh, by some of the residents on that, that street. Uh, the uh, Shore Drive is uh, unusual in that uh, there are, the residents tell me, there's, 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 there's a stormwater collection point and the, the, there's a stormwater drainage pipe that goes directly into the Nashua River. Um, and, and plus you've got the regular uh, sanitary sewer. So there are, you know, uh, uh, what seemed to be a, a, a lot of extra manholes in, in the street. Um, so, and, and they've pointed out to me that over the years, previous paving of that street has led to almost the disappearance of the curb which was put in there with the original subdivision, and it's 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 causing a, you know drainage to you know flow onto property, and so they're concerned about this current project, you know whether or not the street will be in the milling part of it, will whether it will be lowered enough to to allow for enough curbing to <coughs> protect them from that that uh, that extra water, and uh, so if you could. Uh, make note and, and maybe you know, take a look at that and, and uh, try to avoid any problems in the future there. Sure, yeah, that makes perfect sense. We will, we will make note of that. And I, uh, I may have misspoke a little. Um, as part of this paving program with contracted support, we've done the milling and the paving, but we also do, our street, street department does some paving. Uh, they can't always do that uh, milling like our contractor does because they don't have those uh, you know, very expensive tools to play with, right? Um, so there, are, there probably are instances where we've done that. We've gone and done an overlay and it's, we've lost some curb reveal. Um, but when we come through and do a, a project like we're, we're doing with the contracted support, we can remedy some of those issues. So I do encourage people to reach out um, if they have historic issues that they're aware of uh, on the streets that we have coming up. Um, we did establish an email address. What, what, what's the email address? Uh, DPW Paving. Um, at NashuaNH.gov, and that's kind of a uh, that's a distribution list goes to Mark and uh, and our uh, contracted engineer um, and others 
to try to capture all those issues. So I encourage people to email that address again. It was DPW Paving. I think we have that right. If we don't, um, I'm sure you can find it uh, on the website. Or we have uh, also e uh, sent out postcards in advance of paving to folks on the streets or adjacent streets to the paving. Uh, on that postcard, that email address was listed as well. Okay. Thank you. All set, uh, Alderman Jenning? Yes, I am. Alderman Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, actually, to, to you, uh, Mr. Hudson, first off, I, I want to agree with what Alderman uh, Jetty has said. Lock Street. <laughs> there are points where Lock Street Road and curb are even. Um, and it's very old and, and something that had been done in the past, which leads, in our case, not just for the water runoff, but people parking on the sidewalk. Um, because it's hard to tell and sometimes it's just a small amount so they may not feel or they might not care <laughs> because they're not hitting that curb so um, I've seen it also in Ward 3 so I do understand exactly what you're saying and it does cause problems um, the, the comment that I want to make um, is something that happened in uh, my ward last year and um, I think it's it's happened in, in previous years too but there was one street in particular um, one of the things that people have to remember when you're doing, I think it's the reclamation when you're really going all the way down to everything and so on, um, is that there's different crews that do a different aspect of it. So sometimes it seems like it should just be a two week, three week job. It literally takes two to three months because you wait for the people that do that next process to come back around. Um, that is very difficult for residents, um, just keeping that in mind. I got a lot of calls. Um, I know there were like two or three streets and in Ward 3 that that had happened to. And I just kept telling people over and over, the, the signage that goes up lets them know you're coming in to do it, but they assume, um, to be honest with you, Maywood Drive was one of them, which is, which is my street. Um, they just assume that it says it's gonna happen June 1st, that by you know three weeks, two weeks later, it's gonna be done. And we were into August before it, it actually kind of got done. So, um, I think that uh, it's very frustrating for residents because they don't know how long it's going to be taking. They're driving over it. Um, just like sometimes small streets like mine, kids are playing in the road as well. Um, so I just think we just need to be a little bit more cognizant. Maybe when you send out the letters to let them know that their street's going to be paved or put up, that it could take longer than a, a short period of time. <coughs> Kudos on um, everything you're doing, and I really appreciate it. Um, Ward 3 has benefited from having a lot of streets. We've got a lot more to do, but we have benefited, in, and I do appreciate the work that you've done. Thank you. Yes, uh, I apologize. I had another question written in my notes, and I, I totally skimmed over it, um, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hudson, maybe, I don't know if you can answer this question, but I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken, in the first five-year plan, the, the total amount was the same but it did jump from one year, from 2018 to 2019, from 37 million to 41 million. Are you aware of that in the budget from 20, I think it was 2018 to 2019. Do you know why that was? If there was, it maybe it became more expensive than we originally thought, or there was a labor thing or COVID materials, or I don't know, but I wasn't sure if you were aware of that. Or yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure specifically. I know early in the program, we did get a, infusion of some federal paving funds. So early in the program, we had some additional funds. Uh, we take contributions from utilities sometimes in lieu of some restoration where we're gonna do the reclaiming. Doesn't make sense for them to go do a, a full fix of the pavement when we're gonna come by and grind it up uh, you know, a couple months later or whatever. So there, have, there are other uh, contributing funding sources that weigh into the program and support the program. Um, I just want to speak briefly about the scheduling. I, I do I do understand resident concerns with scheduling. Last year we had a lot of cha tra uh, challenges. There were definitely labor issues. Um, the contractor suffered from that. The contractor also suffered from some subcontracting issues so where we had preferred they come and do the curbing right after the milling or whatever it is. Um, a lot of those schedules kind of got messed up last year. So um, this year seems to be going well. We built more timeline uh, controls into our contract and uh, the contractor this year is the same contract as last year. I think they've uh, learned and made an adjustment and we're seeing much better performance, performance this year, so we're happy about that. Um, uh, West Hollis Street, for instance, we milled it and we've base paid most of it and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be quicker with that turnaround. So, um, so 
so yeah, I think uh, hopefully we see better results this year than we did last year in terms of time performance. Perfect. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I see that uh, CFO um, Griffin is in the audience as well. I have a question about the bonding schedule because this goes out over, I believe it's, is it five years? And you're estimating that to get the 37 million, it'll end up costing us 49 once everything is paid back at uh, interest of about three to 4%. With the way that the Fed is raising rates, help me understand, is that a conservative estimate or do you, do you buy all the bonds at once or do you, how, did, how does all that work? Just so I better understand it. Mr. Mr. Griffin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, John Griffin, CFO, Treasurer, Tax Collector. Appreciate being here. I wanted to address uh, Alderman Cathy's question. Um, one of those years, subject to check, we had about a $4 million federal uh, amount to spend on paving related to, I believe, the Broad Street Parkway. So I appreciate you bringing that up, but there was a quite sizable funding source that I believe it was over near um, one of the major thoroughfares, maybe part of Amherst Street. Subject to check. As far as the bonding, um, when it became apparent that we needed to do something with bonding five years ago, um, the mayor, coupled with the DPW director and the, and the leadership at the time, felt we had to do something rather dramatic. I became uh, the CFO in 2010, and we were literally spending a million dollars as part of the capital improvements project, just not enough. So we conceptualized the 10-year plan, but funded, as the mayor said, the first five years. And what we've done is set up a special road and highway uh, fund where the revenue to that fund is the, is the state highway block grant that we like to see a lot more revenue from that, but it does climb slowly. So that's one of the major pieces of setting up that special road and highway fund. The other piece was and it kind of was a good nexus. We took the first 1.1 mil, the first 700,000 from the motor vehicle revenue and moved it in this. So your revenue is the motor vehicle fund off the top, the highway block grant. That pays, that's designed to pay for the debt service. So being conservative, former treasurer for debt would bond in arrears after we spent the money to make sure there wasn't any arbitrage interest uh, so we've literally bonded four, four years of the 7.5. Um, the engineering department and director photo, they've, they've positioned contracts this year to be fun, to, be, to the end the first five years of the program. So they've spent the 37, they will have spent the whole 37.5. We would have borrowed 7.5 times 4 plus this July or August will we'll bond the other 7.5. With respect to, to interest rates, we're programming at 4% going forward. We're worried. Um, a lot of inflation taking place. A lot of costs of things are increasing. But we would, the first set of monies that we had were at rates very attractive, 2.85, 2.01. 1.63 and 1.79. So if you think inflation is 2%, you're really borrowing money at nothing, no cost. But we have to impute the cost of, of uh, the bonding. Back then, we had to bond. We couldn't add $7.5 million annually to the operating budget. So what happens is, as much as Mr. Hudson saying, you know, you might get 10, 15 years, at the, at the time that this program is over, it's fiscal 43. So what we need to program several years from now is an infusion of additional revenue to pay for the bonds in the middle of the program. And how I would recommend doing that is uh, we, we budget in the general fund budget um, motor vehicle very conservatively. We, I was here when we generated 10 million in fiscal 10 that was like the lowest point because back, if you remember, 08, 09, and 10, people really couldn't afford vehicles or replacement vehicles. 
Now it's a different story. You can't get them, and if you get them, they're very expensive. So we, we do see, unless something happens in Concord, and I know Baldwin O'Brien uh, knows this very well, unless somebody tries to reduce the fees that we get, and they have tried to do that, if that passes, that will affect the revenue. But we're very comfortable with our strategy of um, use, uh, putting about $11 million towards the budget and having a surplus of about 4 to $5 million. So somewhere down the road, we're going to have to come to you folks and say, can, would you let us transfer additional motor vehicle revenue into the fund and make it, um, make it whole? But the benefits of the paving program, as is, is I've witnessed, is clearly outweighs not doing it. And as we funded, uh, you know, we've got a major middle school project going. We've got other things going. Um, this would be a good use of the funding. And we've created a mechanism to fund it. Um, but those folks that are in these seats, fiscal 27, fiscal 35, you know, they're, they're going to have to enjoy the, new, the newly paved roads, but also fund it. So that's over the, I see over the next six years funding the last, bond, selling the bond for 7.5, and then over the next five years, additional 7.5. So we have to, we're paying for the debt service out of this fund. And the revenue, as I mentioned, was the highway block grant and the motor vehicle revenue. So everything kind of trues up. It's a self-contained um, revenue and spend. But only if the interest rates don't go crazy. Yeah, the interest rates, we put 4% in. Um, <laughs> we're probably going to sell in July before things happen in August and September. But... Going forward, you know, it's interesting. And then we want, obviously, more revenue, and you'll learn this in the budget. We want the banks to kind of catch up with paying us more for our money that's invested. So it's a combination. It's kind of a double-edged sword. You can't be disappointed at your revenue income and then have a bond that's 1.63 or 1.79. So that's a long way of saying, I think, what you were asking. But if you have any more questions, I'll be happy to answer. Did that answer your questions? It did. We, I've been working with Mr. Griffin. We are going to have a, uh, uh, a, an evening to talk about bonding and how bonding works. And, and by the way, we never, when we pass a bond, we never go out and buy that bond right away. <laughs> uh, as he was just explaining, it <coughs> over time. Um, and, and the only one thing I'll say is bonding plan has two levels. They have the bottom level where things are planned, but not legislated. So those things can shift. And then you have the top part, which once it's legislated, now it falls into payments. So you'll see that whole thing when we, they're updating the bonding plan right now. Any other questions? Seeing none, the motion is for final approval of our 22020. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Thank you. The Alderman O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Also before us this evening is R 22 021, changing the purpose up to $152,030 of unexpected unexpended bond proceeds from the fire department pumper truck and aerial ladder truck purchases to infrastructure improvements to the municipal fire alarm system. Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion to recommend final passage. Okay, the motion on the floor is to recommend final passage of R22021. Any questions? Alderman Kathy? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, may I ask a question of Chief Buxton? Chief? Uh, thank you, Chief. Um, this funding, this is just an initial funding to, to get this uh, new circuit underway, but there will be additional funding needed to finalize a new circuit. Is that correct? Or does this sort of take care of the whole problem all by itself? Mr. Chief? Yes, Chief. Steve Luxton, National Fire. So this will take care of the bulk of the heavy lifting that needs to take place to get both those circuits stood up. Uh, we do have a full-time fire alarm division uh, that maintains this system day in and day out throughout the city. Uh, this will take care of the, the uh, underground work. Uh, it's very easy for them to do above-ground pole-to-pole type work. 
Uh, so there'll be some material cost after the fact, but the bulk of the work is going to be done with this investment. Okay, thank you. That's it. Any other questions, Alderman Sullivan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chief Buxton, to help me understand this, uh, I'll just use round numbers. You borrowed 300,000 to buy a truck. It cost you 100 and, you know, 50 some odd thousand. You had this money left over. You're gonna use that money to rebuild or kind of improve on the circuits in the city, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. If you can find me that truck for 300,000 nowadays, I'll-, I'll <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I was thinking that as you say the number. Hypothetical Whoa. numbers. Alderman, uh, oh, Brian? Yeah, thank you. Chief, I know the answer, so I'm gonna give you a real softball here. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, some of the new aldermen don't understand the ISO. And the ISO requirements, which is the Underwriters Institute, they live down in Gaggles, down in Hartford, Connecticut, where the insurance companies live. But they come up at any given time and they look at the city of Nashua and they determine the home insurance value of, and set the rates of what people would say. So something that the ISO looks at is the fire alarm systems and its maintenance maintenance and whether it operates as well as the quality apparatus training of the men and the list goes on and on and on so therefore by taking this investment could have a benefit to the taxpayers farther down the line of making sure that the uh, insurance rating within the city of nashua stays within the appropriate means in my case better to pay locally than to pay Harvard. <laughs> agreed thank you and part of this fund money also is we were able to buy two trucks one physical year and another physical year together and save a significant amount of money and that's part of this um, so that uh, purchase that you're talking about is a separate bond that we did this is actually two separate bonds okay. for an engine or ladder purchased uh, the one you're thinking of was the following year okay so that also was underspent at that time uh, yes yeah I'll Oh, Alderman Jetty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, you know, at the risk of uh, Alderman O'Brien coming over here and beating me over the head, um, I'm going to ask. I'll never do that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask what might might be considered a very naive uh, question, but you know, I, I did visit the headquarters or, or the uh, the building on uh, East Hollow Street, and uh, and I saw the the alarms, you know, going off and the, and, uh, you know, fr frankly, it, it struck me as kind of a, you know, a, a rudimentary system. And, and I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering, you know, with, you know, I, I was walking out uh, Sunday and I saw some of those boxes and uh, I never even noticed that, that they were there. And I, and it's, you know, one of them is kind of in the, you know, adjacent to a vacant field. And, uh, you know, I understand, you know, in a high rise building or a, an industrial building, you know, you've got these alarm boxes and, but out in, in the neighborhoods, it, it, you know, I'm wondering is, it, you know, how many f fires are currently, or how many emergencies are currently reported by those boxes? And how many are just people picking up their cell phone and calling you and with, with cell phone technology, uh, you know, do we really need these, these, uh, you know, this uh, fire alarm, the, you know, these boxes and things? Chief? <coughs> uh, that's a, actually an excellent question. So probably about 10 years ago, uh, the fire alarm division went, went around and determined which boxes were too deep in the weeds, so to speak, uh, and pulled them out onto the main roads um, because of cell phone technology. Um, we usually have half a dozen to a dozen incidents, working incidents, emergencies reported yearly that come in through the game wall system. Um, so the other benefit that we have as a city, the ones connected to the uh, major buildings and target hazards, uh, the occupancy is either, either going to pay a private alarm company to monitor that alarm, which uh, contributes to a delay in the transmission of the alarm, or they're gonna hook up to our municipal system. Uh, and we basically offer that to them free of cost after their initial investment of the uh, hardware. Uh, and then we receive the immediate notification, there is no delay. 
So the ones hanging on the telephone poles deep in the neighborhoods that you see, if you kind of look around, we've kind of pulled them back onto the main roads based on the technologies that you spoke to. Um, but they do still get utilized from time to time. And the maintenance on those uh, is very minimal. Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, uh, j just to cut to the chase, so the the uh, the investment in this, you know, the, the, this alarm system is still very necessary to, to uh, for you to do your job protecting the the, uh, the city. Yes, it, it is an archaic system. If we were to design the system and the infrastructure as a whole in the city today and try to implement it, you wouldn't want to pay that bill. But where we have such a well-maintained system to continue to grow it a little bit at a time is a very good investment for the city. Okay. Thank you. Well, Ms. Allen, did you have a follow-up or no? no. Alderman Clean. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chief Buxton, when you when you spoke earlier and you mentioned the redundancy and that this that we actually did not have this, there was a little part of me that went, oh, okay, kind of like a, a shocker of, of that. Um, does this redundancy, okay, so maybe I should ask the question a different way. Do we not have redundancy at all in any part of it, or is this just one section that doesn't? Because you mentioned that if certain lines were to go out, we would lose one half of the city. Um, is that because everything focuses into one central point, and that's why we would lose it? Yes, Chief. Yes, so thank you for that question. Um, while it is archaic, like I just said, it is also one of the most reliable or the most reliable system out there. Um, some of you may remember the ice storms we've had in the past uh, where there were significant breakdowns in the power line transmissions in the city. Uh, this system still stood up and we were able to transmit alarms and communicate with our firehouses uh, throughout all of those incidents. Um, the redundancy that I spoke of only exists in those areas that I, I spoke about, the Amherst Street corridor and uh, Circuit 12 all to the southwest quadrant. Um, and part of that is due to Quite, quite honestly, we didn't have another way over the river until we constructed the Veterans Memorial Parkway. Um, you know, we couldn't string cable up the uh, turnpike. They kind of frown on that sort of thing. Uh, and back in the day when we strung the initial line across the turnpike in the area of exit five, that was literally done on a Sunday morning with a couple of fire chiefs in their car slowing traffic down and dragging some line across the highway. <laughs> Uh, to get it done but those days have come and gone and now we need to do it appropriately uh, and it's important that we get a, another line across the turnpike so we have redundancy out there as well thank you i really appreciate that well, so, yes just real quick question we have just uh, or are spending uh, we've upgraded the fire alarm system at, uh, at fairgrounds and now penachuk and of course the new school have all upgraded fire alarm systems. Are they connected via that same system or are they fiber optic connected? No, absolutely. Those are all hardwired connected to the okay. system. So all three schools have an upgraded fire alarm system. Any other questions? Thanks, Chief. Thank you very much. Okay. The motion on the floor is to recommend final approval of R22021. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. Also before us this evening is R-22-024, approving the cost items of a collective bargaining agreement between the National Board of Police Commissioners and the National Police Patrolmen's Association from July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2026. Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion to recommend final passage. All right, the motion on the floor is to recommend final passage of R22024. Any questions? Alderman Sullivan, do you want to ask a question that we need to get the chief up for? Uh, yes, if that's okay. And if he wants to bring any supporting cast. <laughs> <laughs> Come on over, Chief. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. Kevin Rourke, Chief of Police. Thank you, Mr. Question. Chairman. Chief Rourke, uh, I, from my understanding, there are several unions that incorporate the National Police Department. Could you help me understand 
this specific contract and to which officers it applies to? Absolutely. So we do have five unions. This is the patrolman's union. This is our largest union. It's made up when we're at full staff of approximately 114 police officers. Uh, they are the backbone of our police agency. In fact, uh, our city for public safety. Um, they, they are your police officers that are right around on the police cruises, responding to your house uh, on a call. They are your first line detectives. If there's a felony investigation, they are your detectives that are coming out there. Um, they are basically, the best way I can describe it is your front line defense of the police department. Follow up, please. Thank you. You mentioned fully staffed at 114 officers. Yes. Um, in, a, in the patrolman's unit, there's 100, approximately okay. 114. And then I see number of employees in analysis at 136. Karen? Yes. Um, we also have, excuse me, Karen Smith, business manager. And we also have a um, first year agreement and they're in it for one year until they become part of the union when they are a second year. So we would have positions that are first year officers and we would have vacancies and that would total 136. So okay. you don't want to eliminate those positions from the total count because they will be coming along shortly. Okay. Okay. Very good. Any follow up? Go ahead. Uh, there was a lot of talk as we were going through contracts about the health care. Does the city health care apply to this contract? Yes, and a couple of years ago, we started attending the uh, strategy, strategy sessions with the city. Um, so the patrolmen already started switching over a few years ago when the city requested that. So I don't know the exact number. I know it's pretty low of, uh, of 114, that, but I know there's a large majority that switched over in the last couple of years. Uh, we actually had one of our captains on the task force full-time, Craig Allard, who is switch getting everybody to switch over. So we've done a lot of switching over in the last few years. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Alderman Kathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chief O'Rourke, I know that uh, there's been some recruitment efforts by the MPD and wanting to get more police officers on the force. Uh, this might be an easy one, but in your opinion, this contract um, helps keep um, or make recruitment attractive? in your opinion, for officers? Yes, it does. Okay. Absolutely. Any other questions? Alderman Jetty? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so looking at the, uh, the proposed uh, contract um, on page, to, I think it starts on page 22, it talks about wages. Um, so there's a, a list of, of ranks. Can, it goes from uh, part-time employees, second year officer, and it, it goes up to uh, master patrolman two. So can, can you, uh, I don't find any definitions of those positions. What, what are, how are those positions defined? How are they qualified? And, and what about the, you know, it starts at uh, second year officer. What about first year officers? Where are they in this? So the first year officers has their own contract because they're, so to become part of the union, you have to complete one year of service and pass your probationary period, which is 12 months. So they would not be in this. They have their own contract. Um, a second year officer is just a second year officer. They've already completed their one year. It's their first year in the union. Patrolman, senior patrolman, master patrolman, and then master patrolman too. So th those are defined in there, I believe. If they're not, I do have them. The next page, page 23. So Master Patrolman 2. It 
is right there. Do you have the copy of the contract <coughs> on the jetty in front of you? Oh, it's in rules of rights. I'm sorry? Do you have a copy of the contract in front of you? Yes, I do. Okay, because they're, they're defined oh, in there. It's in the menu. Uh, can you point to where it, where it's defined? Oh, hold on one second, sir. So a master patrol officer is, is an officer with seven years, and they must pass a risk written test and pass an oral board. Master patrolman two is 12 years of service and passed the sergeant's uh, oral board. Yeah. Where would I find that? Where is that? It's under our rules and regs. I can, I can send it to you tomorrow if you'd like. Okay. So it's not in the, this contract? It's No, it's under our rules and regs. A second year officer is someone that obviously has is in their second year. A patrolman, uh, patrol officer is a patrol officer. It, full-time member of the National Police Department, who is in his third year of continuous employment, but under five years. A senior patrolman is a full-time member of the National Police Department who has completed five years of continuous service. These are the definitions I can send to you tomorrow, if that's not. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. Because okay. I looked for it in the contract. Yeah, it's under our rules and regs. It's not in the contract. Okay. The um, contract cites the rules and regs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I noticed that it, it cited the rules and regs, but I couldn't find the rules and regs. <laughs> I, I, I went on your website and I couldn't find it anywhere. I, I can send them to you tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Yes. Could I continue? Yes. Follow on. Um, so you you said that the uh, the, you know, the first years are in a separate contract, and so what what is our starting pay? So our first year officer with this contract, the new annual pay would be $58,214. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and do we know what, <clears throat> so, so this schedule, you know, provides for the, uh, uh, the, the straight pay, and, but officers are eligible for overtime in addition to that. Do you, can you tell us what, you know, what, what they're actually paid, including overtime? I, I know they earn it, but I'm just trying to get an idea what the... You know, what so the, each officer is different. We do have some guys that work nonstop. I think they sleep in their uniform. <laughs> and then we have some guys that don't work any overtime. Apparently they're independently wealthy, but... <laughs> so we have the two fire extremes. Uh, we did run a, an analysis, and the, the median of the department is approximately $10,000. 10000 in overtime? Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. Right. And, uh, and how, do, how does our pay schedule, our wage schedule, compare to other... Uh, New Hampshire cities and towns and in uh, northern Massachusetts cities and towns. I know a lot of our officers come from northern Massachusetts, and I'm wondering you know, where we, we do. We do have a lot of officers from Massachusetts. Um, there's been many changes to our uh, job descriptions over the years. A lot of stipulations have changed. So we're not getting as many people from Massachusetts as we did before. Um, are you looking at salaries from other police departments in the area? Yes. Yeah. How, how, how does our, what we're paying our officers, how does that compare to, to other cities and towns in the state and in northern Massachusetts? So we pulled up something from Manchester PD. I tried to go on the website. Um, Manchester is approximately $57,000. Um, but reading their chart, if you go on that contract, I mean, you have to have a degree in it because everything they do, uh, if they belong to a specialty unit with so many years on, uh, it's a chart that um, there's different levels of it and it moves over with different grades. So it's tough to pinpoint what their actual salary is. 
I think they're around, right around us, within a couple thousand dollars. I checked with Lowell um, PD this afternoon. Um, they're at about $58,000 starting, but you gotta understand they have the Quinn bill, if you ever heard of that. Uh, they have, if you have an associate's degree, it's an added 15% onto your salary. A bachelor's degree is 20% and a master's is 25%. So they're, they're quite higher. Uh, Mass State Police, I spoke with a sergeant today. Their starting pay is at $70,000. Uh, again, they have the Quinn bill. So if you want to look at agencies that, that I would compare myself to, uh, you know, besides Mass State Police, I think we're in the same ballpark. You know, I think in New Hampshire we're compensated well. We're in the top tier, I would absolutely say that. But for dollar for dollar, I don't know that because when you get into those stages of specialty pay and how many years you're on, it gets difficult to pinpoint. It's not as easy as saying, all right, they make 58 stock and they make 59. It's not that easy. So, I, but I would definitely say that we're definitely in the top echelon of being paid in New Hampshire. But I think our service is a lot better than other departments that I've mentioned, so. All set, Alderman Jenny. Yes, thank you. Alderman Tebow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a quick comment. Um, some of you know, I've probably said this before, that my grandfather was a Nashua patrolman. So I have a lot of reverence for our police force here in Nashua. I just, I, I you know, the, the union uh, made this contract. I, I still think it's probably way too low. Uh, there's much less consequential jobs out there um, making a lot more than 58,000. So it's low, in my opinion, to begin with. So I will fully support what the union and the police force have come to us with um, when this comes to the Board of Aldermen and 100% uh, behind the patrolmen and, and uh, this contract. So thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, motion on the floor is to recommend final passage of our 22024 to the full board. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Also before us this evening is R-22-026, authorizing first amendments to the developer agreement for Bronstein redevelopment. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to recommend final passage. The motion on the floor is to recommend final passage of R-22026. Are there any questions? Mr. Sullivan will join us. We just, wanted, other, we, just wanted, Sullivan. we just wanted him to not feel not included. We wanted him to be <laughs> no. in the horseshoe. Uh, warms my heart. Sullivan, Kathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I do have two questions more for confirming curiosity. So the original agreement was structured where the, these um, builders would not pay any fees. They estimated a certain amount. That amount was incorrect, so they're just sort of amending that amount. Is that the nutshell? Yes, that okay. is correct. Uh, I noticed that in this particular contract, um, it mentions in passing impact fees, but in the actual contract, it does not mention impact fees. So impact fees are not included in this. It's just building fees. Is that correct? It, impact fees were included in the initial development agreements, and those impact fee waivers were adequate that were originally contemplated by the first version of the, the development agreement. So that estimation was accurate, as those fees are a fixed fee based on the, the unit mm -hmm. count. It's the building permit fees only that needed to be modified, but impact fees were included with the initial development agreement, yes. Follow up, Alderman Kathy? Please, Mr. Chair. Um, obviously, we weren't, I wasn't around for this when this contract passed, I think it was 2021. Um, why were impact fees uh, waived? Because my understanding it is gonna be multifamily, so there will be children in in this particular development? That's correct. There, there were, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, um, and I guess I should have said Matt Sullivan, community <laughs> development for the record, apologies for that. Uh, the, there are a few factors at play here, one of which is that this is a redevelopment, and so there's an existing unit count, and therefore that's, that's not contemplated as new development. 
However, for the additional units that are contemplated beyond the existing unit count, uh, the opinion was at the time that because this was a partnership between the city and the private developer, and because of this being a critical affordable housing development, the view at the time when the development agreement was initially voted upon was that those impact fees would be waived in the interest of creating this affordable housing and particularly the tight financial pro forma of actually developing the project. So certainly it is a unique situation that those fees were waived, but they were contemplated in that initial agreement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All set? Mm -hmm. Alderman Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regarding the delta between the building permit fees, originally quoted at 100, now coming out to 250, that's a big delta. Yeah. When were those original fees calculated and what goes into that calculus of a yeah. permit fee? I mean, I would think if the city is quoting it, then they would have a pretty good, good understanding of what the permit fees will cost. Yeah. Uh, my question is all over the place. When did you originally quote them? and uh, what goes into the delta of that 150,000 that we're looking at now? Yeah. Mr. Sullivan, uh, yeah, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, <laughs> motion, demotion, uh, not sure. Uh, great question, I'm actually really happy that you asked. I've actually had to learn a little bit about this process as it's, I was not intimately involved in the initial development agreement and legislation. Uh, there were a few sort of perfect storm items that happened with this particular waiver request. The first of which is that due to the financing nature of the project, the estimates of construction cost and building permit fees associated with it had to be done very, very early in the process for some of the federal funding particularly. And so with that in mind, the plans upon which the city based their fee waiver estimates were at a, at a concept level rather than a final design level. And what happened is that we underestimated a few things. Number one, we underestimated some of the fixture counts within the development based on the unit mix. So we used a comparable project, uh, the Marshall Street Apartments, to use as the basis for these calculations. We didn't understand that the unit mix would ultimately include uh, the number of three bedroom, four bedroom, and five bedroom units that were ultimately included in the project. Uh, additionally, we were in the midst of a, a fee update process as well, so that was an initial consideration that ultimately led to the larger delta. But quite simply, the, the early timing, or the, the very early timing necessary to create the estimates, the level of design that was actually available at that time for the building department to review, combined with the fact that the, the unit fixture counts were substantially uh, greater than initially anticipated, combined lastly with the fact that the comparable units that we looked at were not actually comparables, all of those led to sort of this perfect storm resulting in the delta that you see presented this evening. Thank you very much. So is that time? Is that what that is? It's, it's, it's level of design. <laughs> it's level of design. And so I, I think that, does that answer your question? It's because of this being a concept level design we were not able to accurately estimate the final fee payments that were contemplated. Oh, okay. And, and should more time have been available in that process where we would have made the decision based on final building permitting plans, I would offer that this agreement would, be more ac would have been more accurate at the time of the drafting of the first development agreement. Okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Okay, well said. Alderman Cathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To piggyback off of Alderman Sullivan's uh, questions, um, do you foresee this happening again? Because it's an er it's still early. There's still groundbreaking. They only got the elevator shafts up, I, I believe. So could this happen again? And is there a point where it becomes an untenable situation where we're just giving away too much money in this situation? Well, Mr. Sullivan? The answer is no. Uh, we are we are very we're fully confident in the numbers that are presented within this two hundred fifty thousand dollar waiver, and that is because the stage that we're at in the building permitting process. And so there's no we're very comfortable with this two hundred fifty thousand dollar number. Uh, certainly, I know that the the project developers are available if there are questions, but that very discussion did happen prior to this legislation being drafted and submitted for the committee's review and the board's review. But this is you know. As, as final as it comes, I would say. Great question, though. Thank you. Well said. Any other questions? I do have one more. 
Oh, over the shoulder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and I know this is a budget meeting, but uh, we referred at the beginning about Bronstein Apartments, the 4% mm -hmm. entity and the 9% entity. I'm curious about the difference between those two entities. Uh, yes, Director. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I defer to the folks online to provide a little more context about that, if the committee would be comfortable accepting that public testimony? Sure. Attorney Leonard? Or, yes, Mr. Yes. Uh, Jay, I'll, I'll take this. Uh, right, good. good evening, uh, Mr. Chair. This is uh, Rich Mazaki. I'm with Boston Capital Development. Um, be happy to address that question. Um, it really is just due to the nature of the affordable housing financing programs. Um, by the way, just as a mic check, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so the, given the nature of the affordable housing development financing programs, there are uh, two separate types of tax credits that we applied for to uh, try to maximize the, the leverage of uh, federal uh, financing sources. Uh, one of them happens to be called a 4% tax credit and the other is a 9% tax credit. So. That's really the, the reason for it. And it just allows us to, uh, to again, maximize the, the capital funding from the uh, government. Thank you very much. Well said. Yes. Thank you. All right. The motion before us is R22026. Recommend the final passage to the full board. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. New business ordinances? None. Table and committee? None. General discussion? Anyone? Alderman Clee. Thank you. Um, I just, I probably could have waited for remarks by the alderman, but I just wanted to um, make a comment that I reached out to uh, Director Sullivan today using the uh, director's telephone number and um, almost had a heart attack because the message on it said that they were searching for a new director. And I, when he finally reached back to me, I said, please tell me this is not so, and it is not so. They just have not changed their message, and uh, hopefully they get on it soon. Okay, thanks. Any other general discussion? Seeing none, uh, there's no public in the audience and no public online, so no public comment. Remarks by Alderman. Alderman O'Brien. Thank you. I, I just want to say that uh, very happy that we invested so money back into the uh, fire alarm system. <clears throat> Having worked with that and growing up with it, well, of course, we all grew up with it. It was invented in 1860. And it was one hell of an invention if it's still here in use since 1860. It's infallible. Why is could fall? trees can disconnect them, yet it's just a supervisory system. So it creates an open circuit so the technicians can go out and find out where the fault is. It's, you know, it's quite ingenious. Runs practically on nothing, milliamps and everything. And it's quite, it's actually uh, the only thing, the first thing in America that was bilingual. You don't have to speak English to pull the firebox. And you pull the firebox, you get a five minute and three minutes. Such as I remember a young lady who got off the bus one time and another gentleman got off the bus and was following her and she was concerned. So she pulled the firebox and the gentleman crossed the street or something, you know, I'm, I'm not saying anything nefarious would have happened, but to me the box worked. We were there less than three minutes and she was in tears and she explained her dilemma and we called a cruiser and was able to take her home safely. So I'm glad we invested in it. Uh, very few false alarms. There have been some, but it's a situation that uh, does guarantee and if this system doesn't work, today's modern technology and replacing it, I think like Chief Buxton said, would have been a lot more money. So I'm glad so compliment you all for doing that. And that's also coming from the nostalgia side of me. Uh, and also was brought up redundancy. That's part of the insurance requirement. Telephones, the fireboxes and everything. Uh, I don't know. Many a night I sat there in a firehouse and my father said it to me in his career. 
I've been listening to bells all night. <laughs> <laughs> we knew all seven kids in my family not to bother the old man if he said he was listening to bells all night. And I get to say it to my kids too, <laughs> you know. But it's a, situ it's a system that does work. So thank you all. For those of you that are, oh, Alderman Thank you. <clears throat> I want to thank the committee for passing the uh, Bronstein control. Development oh, Bronstein. Um, waiver because it's so important. That project has been on the table for 15 mm, or more please. years. Um, it, it, it's going to do a lot for that area, and it's going to do a lot for the people that once lived there that are going to be able to move back in there into a new apartment. So. I, I think it means a lot. I think we help the city a lot by doing that. So thank you. I was going. Oh, Go ahead, Mr. I was just going to say that for those of you that are younger, in the old days, when that box was pulled, it has a number on it, and they used to sound the alarm. And everybody, everyone in the city had all the box numbers. Of course, today there are too many of them. And the box numbers, they knew exactly where the fire was, and and if it was a second or third alarm. To the fire. We don't want anybody doing that today. You're absolutely right. The telegraph used to put out the box. Yeah, yeah. You could still find them around. And then it was, the, we affectionately called it the Budank. <laughs> the Don Horn, it was scared to be geez out of you. <laughs> you know, yeah, but, it, but I never heard it. The wife would hear it and wake me up and say, You better get going, there's a fire. <laughs> you know I mean? I'd be asleep at home in my bed. <laughs> All the Kathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to uh, hope the other aldermen who um, won't be here are enjoying their vacations. Um, and uh, I did want to echo what Alderman O'Brien said earlier about insurance. Um, having had my house appraised twice in the last two to three years, well aware that uh, fire response rates and uh, all of that goes into both the insurance and the appraisal rates mm -hmm. for homes. So. Um, not that that's the only reason to do it, but I, I'm more than happy to su support the fire because we, we do have some alarm issues that we need to take care of in, in the coming years. And then also I just wanted to make a general comment that it, being a new alderman, you know, you get hit with a lot of things and um, there are quite a few constituents that don't want you to spend money, <laughs> which is fine, that's, that's fair. Um, but particularly with the street project, that's really gonna save us quite a lot of money in the long run and uh, especially we've already seen the consensus about how we're going to grow in the future and so it's just spending money now so we don't have to spend more money later so I, it's a it's a knock it out of the park for me personally so that's why I would vote to spend money on something like that especially with infrastructure so I just wanted to you know uh, comment on that so okay you know any other remarks Alderman O'Brien Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. The motion on the floor is to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. It's 839. Thank you very much.